as a smack era comes to a close, how appropriate that I should be talking about tomorrow's medicine today. We hear loads of things about the exciting possibilities for tomorrow's medicine. There's the chance that we could revolutionize diagnostics. With artificial intelligence, there's the opportunity for us to use smartphones, smart speakers, wear, um, wearable technology, to allow patients to take more control of their own health, and to allow us to deliver more care outside hospitals, hospitals without walls. And um, <clears throat> there's the possibility even that we could manufacture drugs totally differently. We could 3D print drugs at local pharmacies, personalizing drug treatment for individual patients. All of those things are now possible with the existing technologies. But there is a problem with new medical technology, and that's that it takes way too long to get it into practice. In fact, it's said that it takes an average of about 17 years to get new medical technology into practice. Imagine if it took us that long to get the technology in our homes. We'd still be making phone calls on phones like this. It's a flip phone. We'd still be listening to music on devices like this. First generation iPod. It's heavy. And if we wanted to watch a movie, we wouldn't be able to just stream it from Netflix, oh no. We'd have to go to the local Blockbuster store and rent the DVD. None of us would want progress in technology to be that slow in our homes, so why should we accept it for our healthcare? Now, there are lots of reasons why progress is so slow. There are regulatory issues, issues around reimbursement. Clinical trials are way too inefficient and way too slow. But sometimes, we, as clinicians, are also an important part of the problem. And the problem there is the naysayers. And they're the people who will tell about those exciting technologies I just spoke about. And they'll smirk, and they'll shake their heads and rub their chins. And they'll look at us and say, yeah, it's never going to happen. They'll say, how can we expect to use artificial intelligence in our practice if we can't even get our informatics systems to speak to each other? How can we expect to 3D print drugs when we can't even get our printers to print paper without breaking down? They say that we're just dreamers. And you know, I think that all of us at different times are both dreamers and naysayers. And maybe at the start of our careers, we were much more likely to be dreamers. We were full of big ideas, full of enthusiasm. We thought that we could change things. But as we go through and we get frustrated by the inertia, the challenges, the barriers to change, we find it so difficult. Nothing seems to improve. And maybe like a child who loses that sense of wonder and magic, we become the naysayers. But if there's one great way to make sure that we never get a better tomorrow, it's to stop dreaming about a better tomorrow. We always have to keep dreaming. We always have to keep asking those questions that begin with, what if? And to prove it, I'd like to tell you a bit about my story. I'd like to tell you about the great people that I've had the privilege to work with who keep on asking what if. And I'd like to tell you about what a great difference it's making. And in doing that, I'd hopefully like to show you that all of us can make a real difference if we allow ourselves to dream and to keep asking those questions that begin with, what if? So my story began in 2005 when I was given an amazing opportunity to do a PhD with Simon Carley and with Kevin McWay Jones in Manchester. At the time, we had a big problem with chest pain. Patients with suspected cardiac chest pain were being routinely admitted to the hospital for an average of more than two days for us to do tests. Most of them didn't have an acute coronary syndrome at all, but the tests were so insensitive in the emergency department, they had to be admitted. So we asked a very simple question. 
What if we could rule out the diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction with a single blood test in the emergency department? And we worked really hard. We recruited hundreds of patients to clinical studies. We took their consent, collected their data, followed them up, took their blood samples, analyzed their blood samples, and we evaluated 19 biomarkers that we thought would be the new troponin that would give us the answer. And slowly but surely, our dreams turned into nightmares. Biomarker after biomarker returned the most perfectly useless ROC curves you could ever imagine in your life. They follow the diagonal, it's perfectly useless, no diagnostic accuracy whatsoever. <laughs> but then we got our breakthrough, and our breakthrough came from industry. Rush Diagnostics manufactured the first high-sensitivity troponin assay, which could detect tiny concentrations of cardiac troponin for the first time. But there was still work to do. If we used that product, just as the manufacturer tells us we should use it, we still couldn't rule out myocardial infarction with a single test. So we had to do some thinking. And we thought, what if we decided to rule out myocardial infarction in patients who have completely undetectable troponin, even with that high sensitivity assay? And we found that we could do it. 100% negative predictive value. So we repeated it in another study, found the same. And we repeated it in a multi-center international study, found the same. But research from one group is rarely enough to change international practice. And we were lucky to be part of a global community of like-minded researchers. So led by Ed Carlton, Andrew Chapman, and John Pickering, we asked, what if we pooled the data from all of the similar international studies in this field to work out if this strategy really does work? And we found that it does. You can rule out a myocardial infarction with one test in patients who have undetectable troponin with a high sensitivity assay. We made a difference. But then we thought, maybe we can do even better. What if we also took advantage of the data in patient symptoms and the ECG, and we combined that with the biomarker, troponin. And what if we didn't have a cutoff for troponin at all? What if we used it as a continuous variable? So the higher the troponin goes, the more likely it is that a patient has an acute myocardial infarction. We all know that's true. That's how biomarkers work. But we never use it in practice that way. What if we did? And what if instead of just ruling out a few patients, we calculated the probability that every patient has an acute myocardial infarction, and we apply that on an individual level. So we developed a decision aid called TMAX, very, very simple observational research, collecting data using logistic regression uh, analysis. And here you can see a, a version of the computerized algorithm, just answer a few simple questions, enter the troponin results, and you'll get the calculated probability of the diagnosis a risk group, and a suggested course of action for the clinician. We validated it, we showed it what could work, we implemented it, we've treated over 7,000 patients with it, and, and regionally, we hope to collect data from 30,000 patients every year using this TMAX algorithm. We proved that we can do it, we can make a difference. And that leads us on to where we are now hoping to collect this massive data set, and all the data are collected electronically because it's a computer algorithm. So now we're asking, what if we used that data and linked the data that we collect to data about patients' outcomes? And what if we use that to continually refine the algorithm so we don't need to go on such a long journey of doing clinical studies ever again? And we know that the algorithm we're using is always as good as it possibly can be based on the data and the evidence that we've accrued so far. So I've learned that you really can make a difference if you have patience, if you work hard, if you collaborate. And quite importantly, if you're given opportunities to do this by other people around you, I've been very lucky to get opportunities. And that brings me on to my second point. We have to nurture the dreams of others. I was lucky to have my dreams nurtured, and now I've got to nurture the dreams of others too. We all should do that, and I have the privilege of working with some great young doctors. I'll tell you about the questions they're asking now. So there's Niall. Niall's asking, what if we pulled objective data from patients' ECGs to update the probability of ACS, removing the need for subjective interpretation and 
pay and error. We have Abdul who's asking, what if we moved the diagnostics to the pre-hospital phase so patients don't even need to come into the ED? We could use points of care testing with the algorithm. And Charlie, who's asking, what if we don't just calculate the probability of the diagnosis of an acute coronary syndrome, what if we go even further and calculate the probability that patients will benefit from different treatments so that we can target the treatments to those who benefit the most, minimizing the risk of harm, precision medicine in the ED? Those are great questions. If you put them all together and if we achieve that, we'll have one fantastic, sophisticated, computerized decision support system. Just imagine the possibilities. We could apply it to so many different things. But importantly, we'll have developed those fantastic individuals who can keep on asking those questions in the future. And that brings me on to my last point. It's not just our own dreams that we need to follow. We need to share the dreams of others. We need to work to make their dreams a reality. I now have the privilege of being the director of the Diagnostics and Technology Accelerator, which partners with industry to generate evidence for new medical technologies. And there's some tremendously exciting technology out there. But the industry needs us to work with them to design those products to meet the needs of patients and clinicians. So I'll tell you about a few of them. Inline blood gas sampling, what if we didn't need to take a nurse away from the bed space to do blood gas analysis in critical care? What if we didn't need to handle the line? What if we didn't need to use excessive blood volumes? What if this could all be automated so the nurse could program in the times of the blood draws at the start of the shift and it will just happen, the results will be pushed to the nurse? This can now happen with this device. But we've got to work with the company to get the evidence to show that it's accurate and to make sure it's appropriately designed for the clinicians who will use it. What about genetic testing? You might think that this is the antithesis of what we do in acute care and you'd be forgiven for thinking so, but it is not. We're going to see this more and more. And so just for example, there is a mutation, a genetic mutation or SNP. And if patients have that SNP and they receive gentamicin antibiotics, they may go profoundly deaf and it's irreversible. Testing for that SNP takes three days at the moment. So you can't do that in the context of sepsis. But now, Gene Drivers manufactured a point of care test that can get the results in just 45 minutes. So we've worked with the company to see how can we apply this in practice. And the best place we think is in the neonatal ICU. Lots of babies have suspected sepsis. That gentamicin is the antibiotic of first choice. And if the patients have the SNP, they're particularly susceptible to the deafness. They'll get a lifetime of developmental delay and all of the problems that ensue with a simple point of care test. Maybe we can avoid that. And then lastly, I talked about home technology. We all know about smart speakers, Alexa, Google, Cortana, and Siri. And there's so much potential to use them in healthcare. The companies want to use them in healthcare, but they need us to tell us how. So, Here's an example of how we might use it, a project we're doing with, uh, with Amazon. Alexa has a brother called Lex. That's a counterpart in healthcare. And we've heard in a previous smart from Ashley Liebig about how nurses should run the code. In a cardiac arrest situation, it makes sense for the nurse to be the team leader, so we get cognitive offload for the doctor. But why should we use a highly skilled nurse to do that task? Couldn't we use Lex? What if Lex could pull data from all of the monitoring systems? What if Lex could interact with the team leader, could prompt us to adhere to the resource algorithms? The technology's there, we can achieve it. We've just got to work with the companies to make it happen. And so, if we don't want it to take 17 years to get technology like this in practice, we must never allow ourselves to be the naysayers. We have to be the dreamers. We have to nurture the dreams of the others that we're working with, the next generation. And we have to share the dreams of others, work with them to make their dreams a reality. We all have a responsibility to do that. And to do this, it shouldn't need to take a million years, but it absolutely does need to take a million dreams. Please, let's never stop dreaming. Let's never stop asking the questions that begin with, what if? Thank you.